January, 1969. You used to be a Navy man, but your time on the high seas is long gone. These days, you're a photo interpreter, or as they call it in the intelligence community, a PI. You work for the National Photographic Interpretation Center in Washington, D.C. Your job is to look at satellite photos and monitor a secret Soviet launch site behind the Iron Curtain. Just as you're about to get down to business, hey, working hard or hardly working? Your coworker looms over your desk. You ignore him and focus on the task at hand. You remove a spool of film from its can, spread it out across the table, and attach it to the reel. You flip on the table light, peer through your microscope, and adjust the lenses. He doesn't take the hint. You PIs, I swear, I don't know how you do it. Photo after photo, day after day. Yeah, well, it's the job. It's grunt work. Being an analyst, now that's real work. He always reminds you that he's a CIA analyst. He reminds everyone. Mind if I take a look? He's already shoved you out of the way before you can answer the question. So this is it, huh? The Soviet launch site? Complex J, yeah, that's right. Right, right, the elusive J-bird. He rolls his eyes and peers through your microscope. These photos, they all look the same. Hey, if you don't mind, I have work to do. He gives you a not-so-friendly pat on the back and leaves you to your business. Finally, you readjust the lens, peer through the microscope, and wind the reel. When the next photo slides into place, your eyes go wide. There is no doubt what you're looking at. A massive rocket sitting on the Soviet launch pad. And it's not just any rocket. A rocket that's as big and powerful as the Saturn V. A rocket designed for one purpose, to put a Soviet cosmonaut on the moon. You may not be a CIA analyst, but your grunt work has definitely paid off today. You just discovered a photo of the Jaybird. As you leap to your feet and rush to notify your supervisor, you hope it's not too late. With the rocket on the pad, there's a real possibility the Soviets are about to beat the US to the moon. And considering there's a lag time between when the photo was taken and when it landed on your desk, there's a chance they already have. From Wondery, this is American History Tellers. Our history, your story. I'm Lindsey Graham. Throughout the late 1960s, CIA analysts and photo interpreters had been monitoring Soviet rocket facilities. Through their surveillance, they discovered the existence of the N-1 rocket. The N-1 was a heavy-lift launch vehicle designed to deliver large payloads far beyond low-Earth orbit, meaning, in theory, the rocket could be used to send Soviet cosmonauts to the moon. When Richard Nixon took office, U.S. officials were debating whether the Soviets could feasibly beat the U.S. to the moon. Some believe the Soviets didn't stand a chance. Others had their doubts. One thing was clear, the race was still on, but the home stretch was in sight. And in the final leg, the Soviets and the Americans were neck and neck. In 1961, John F. Kennedy stood before Congress and declared that the U.S. should commit itself to putting a man on the moon. Eight years later, Kennedy's dream would become a reality with the launch of Apollo 11. The man who would become the public face of that moment was Neil Armstrong. Armstrong had started his career as a naval aviator before becoming a test pilot at NASA's Flight Research Center in Edwards, California. In 1966, he had served as command pilot of the Gemini 8. On that mission, Armstrong had performed the first successful docking of two vehicles in space. His fellow crew members, astronauts Edwin Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, had equally impressive careers. Aldrin had set a record on the Gemini 12 mission for the most hours spent outside a spacecraft. Collins had set an altitude record for human flight on the Gemini 10. Now the three of them would lead the first mission to land on the moon. At a press conference in 1969, Armstrong told a reporter, I think we're going to the moon because it's in the nature of the human being to face challenges. It's by the nature of his deep inner soul. We're required to do these things just as salmon swim upstream. The astronauts were in good hands. Gene Krantz, the flight director for Apollo 11, had a reputation for being tough as nails. Sporting a crew cut and a stern expression, he was all business. 
After the tragedy of the Apollo 1 fire, Kranz vowed it would never happen again, telling his team, from this day forward, flight control would be known by two words, tough and competent. Tough means we are forever accountable for what we do or what we fail to do. Competent means we will never take anything for granted. When you leave this meeting today, you will go to your office, and the first thing you will do there is write tough and competent on your blackboards. It will never be erased. Each day when you enter the room, these words will remind you of the price paid by Grissom, White, and Chaffee. These words are the price of admission to the ranks of mission control. The plan was set. The launch of Apollo 11 would take place on July 16, 1969. As the command module pilot, Collins would remain in orbit while Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the moon. That left one question remaining. Which astronaut would take the first step? Aldrin wanted it to be him. He was vocal about it, too, appealing to the other Apollo astronauts for support. Even his father, a powerful oil executive, made his son's case to the higher-ups at NASA. But in the end, NASA picked Armstrong. Their stated reasons were practical. Armstrong was the senior member of the team. And from where he was seated in the lunar lander, he would have a clear path to the exit hatch. But the real reason, according to Chris Kraft, a NASA engineer, is that the quiet and confident Armstrong was a better candidate than the assertive, ambitious Aldrin. But whatever the reason, the decision was final. Neil Armstrong would make history and become an American hero with one small step. Meanwhile, back in the USSR, the Soviets were gearing up to take a major step of their own. The CIA's discovery of the N-1 rocket troubled U.S. officials. The Soviet rocket looked as big and powerful as the Saturn V, but proof of its existence presented more questions than answers. Was it a manned rocket? Were the Soviets preparing for a lunar mission? Would they beat the U.S. to the moon? Though the answers were unclear, one thing was certain. With a rocket on the launch pad, the Soviets looked poised to make a move. And so for the U.S., the pressure was on. Unbeknownst to U.S. intelligence officials, the Soviets had already attempted an unmanned launch of the N-1 in February 1969. It ended in disaster, with the rocket crashing 183 seconds after liftoff. But the Soviets were undeterred. They tried again on July 3rd, less than two weeks before the U.S. was set to launch Apollo 11. This time, the rocket barely got off the ground. It lifted only a few hundred feet before collapsing back onto the launch pad in flames. The failure of the N-1 rocket was a crisis for the Soviet space program. As a Soviet engineer admitted, we are desperate for success, especially now when the Americans intend in a few days to land people on the moon. If Apollo 11 succeeded, the race would be lost, and the Soviets knew it. So they decided to make one last-ditch effort. They decided to send their Luna 15, an unmanned robotic vessel, to the moon to collect soil. It would not be as significant as landing humans on the moon, but if the Soviets could bring back lunar samples before Apollo 11, it would still be a considerable victory, and it would certainly steal some of the spotlight from the U.S. And so, on July 13th, just three days before Apollo 11's scheduled takeoff, the Soviets launched Luna 15 into space. Though the contest with the Soviets for technological superiority had always been a race, now it was a literal one a U.S. manned spacecraft was about to chase down a Soviet robotic vessel, and the Luna 15 had a three-day head start. In the final days leading up to the launch of Apollo 11, the outcome of the mission was far from certain. Many Americans were beginning to wonder, could the U.S. really pull this off? The anxiety over the Apollo mission was so widespread, it reached the highest level of American government, the office of President Nixon. Imagine it's July 1969. You're a writer, and not just any writer. You're a speechwriter for the President of the United States. You sit at your desk in front of the typewriter, carefully crafting a very important address. <clears throat> you stare at the clock as it ticks ever closer to your deadline. In a few days' time, Apollo 11 will blast off into space. If all goes according to plan, for the first time in history, man will walk on the moon. Your job is to write a victory speech for the President. You crack your knuckles. Type the first words. My fellow Americans, you want to make sure this speech sings. It'll be one for the history books. You type a few sentences, read them out loud, but they don't sound right on your tongue. Frank Borman, line one. That's former astronaut Frank Borman, commander of the Apollo 8. 
Put him through. Frank, how are you? Thanks for taking my call. Of course, of course. Well, what can I do for you? You're working on this moonshot speech. Yes, yeah, just wrapping it up now. What's your angle? Apollo 11 is a tremendous feat that exhibits great hope for mankind. Yeah. Listen, I don't mean to tell you how to do your job. Frank, you're the space liaison to the White House. By all means. Fine. You may want to consider an alternative posture for the president in the event of a mishap. A mishap? What kind of mishap, Frank? He doesn't answer right away. Frank? (sighs) I'm thinking of the widows here. When you hear those words, the gravity of the situation comes into sharp focus. These men are about to go where no man has ever gone before. If anything goes wrong, those astronauts may never make it home. They may never see their families again. Yeah, understood, Frank. Hey, I'll send you a copy when it's done. You hang up the phone. You place your fingers over the keys, and you start typing. Fate has ordained that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace will stay on the moon to rest in peace. You pray. It's a sentence President Nixon will never have to utter. The man in this story is William Sapphire, a speechwriter for President Nixon. On the advice of former astronaut Frank Borman, he wrote a backup address for the president to deliver in case the moon mission ended in tragedy. Labeled, In Event of Moon Disaster, the contingency speech praised the Apollo 11 astronauts. In their exploration, they stirred the people of the world to feel as one. In their sacrifice, they bind more tightly the brotherhood of man. But on the morning of July 16, 1969, everything was working perfectly as the Apollo 11 lifted off. Werner von Braun looked on from the launch control center as his Saturn V rocket made a perfect ascent into space. His life's dream was finally becoming a reality. Man was going to the moon. Apollo 11 traveled 240,000 miles in 76 hours before entering lunar orbit on July 19th. The next day, Aldrin and Armstrong left Collins in the command module and moved to the lunar craft. It was called the Eagle, but Aldrin called it something else, the weirdest looking contraption I have ever seen. On July 20th, five days into the mission, it was time for that contraption to land on the moon. While the Americans prepared for the lunar descent, the Soviet mission was running into a major problem. The rough, mountainous terrain of the moon made it impossible for the Luna 15 to land. A new orbit had to be calculated. But that created an even bigger issue. The Soviets couldn't be sure where the robot would touch down. NASA was worried that the Luna 15 would interfere with the American mission. There was some concern it might cause communication issues or even collide with the Eagle. Inside Mission Control, some 20 miles south of Houston, NASA's team of flight controllers sat with their eyes glued to their consoles. Tensions were running high. But Gene Krantz, Apollo 11's flight director, maintained his composure. Krantz leaned into his communications panel and spoke a few words to his team. This is no bullshit. We're going to land on the moon. We don't even think of tying this game. We think only to win. We're going to win. So let's go have at it, gang. As the descent began, everything was going as planned, and all systems were a go. But then, at 30,000 feet above the moon's surface, an alarm light flashed. Aldrin radioed in. Program alarm. 1202. 1202. This alarm meant something was wrong with the flight computer. It was running out of memory to perform calculations. In mission control, Krantz remained calm. He waited for his team to analyze the situation. But the lunar craft was descending fast. Armstrong called again. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. In response, Krantz shouted into his comm system, demanding an answer from his guidance officer. Guido! The guidance officer wanted more time, time Krantz did not have. Krantz banged his fist on the console. The guidance officer looked down at the timings of the alarms. They were only seconds apart, each one causing a reboot. But the computer was behaving exactly as it was designed. Despite the interruptions, no critical navigation data was lost. The officer made a split-second decision. Go! Go, damn it! The Capcom relayed the message. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. As the Eagle approached the moon's surface, the alarms kept coming. At 3,000 feet over the moon, one sounded, this time a 1201, another computer issue. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 
And still, the answer from mission control was press on. We're go, same type, we're go. Just over a thousand feet above the moon's surface, the Eagle began its final descent. As the flames thrust downward, controlling the rate of descent, Armstrong and Aldrin realized that they had another problem on their hands. They had overshot the landing zone. Armstrong overrode the computer and switched to manual control. He was now landing the craft by himself. But the terrain was rocky, filled with boulders and craters. There wasn't a smooth surface anywhere in sight. And to make matters worse, the Eagle was low on fuel. If the Eagle ran out of gas, there was no escape plan. Armstrong and Aldrin would be on their own, left to die in space. With 60 seconds of fuel remaining, Armstrong struggled to find a safe landing spot. Krantz told his Capcom, you better remind them there ain't no damn gas stations on the moon. The clock was ticking. Over the comm system, the Capcom announced, 30 seconds, forward. Then Aldrin called out, lights on. The low fuel light. Armstrong was out of time. It was now or never. In Houston, they waited in silence as the Eagle went in for touchdown. At 3.18, Houston time, Armstrong's voice cut through the silence in the control room. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. A few hours later, Armstrong would open the hatch of the lunar module. As he backed out, a small camera connected to the Eagle would broadcast live to television screens all across the world. 600 million people would watch in amazement as Neil Armstrong climbed down the ladder and placed a foot on the moon. Mm-hmm.